everybody and welcome to the complete and in-depth guide for the Wardens, the final boss in the Tombs of a Mascot. That's been long awaited by my viewers because people have been asking for it for a while and I've covered all four other paths and bosses already. So if you've not seen them, go check them out. Now before we get started, this video is not a gear recommendation. This is a complete guide on how to deal with every mechanic on this boss fight in a solo. But if there's any difference in teams, I'll also speak about those. Again, people really enjoyed the previous path video, so I'll try and lay this out just like that. Obviously, this boss doesn't have a path, it's just the boss fight, but I'll try and make everything that I'm doing have solid timestamps in the description so you can find what you need fast. Now, the Wardens is a boss fight consisting of two bosses, Tumacan's Warden and Eladinus's Warden. Now, each of these have slightly different mechanics and slightly different ways to force fights, which we'll go over. There's no better time than to hop into the game and take a look. Because of how in-depth and confusing these mechanics can be, this will be the first video where I'm not doing a live voiceover for the tutorial. I'm going to talk about every mechanic and try to find a relevant clip to put over the top. I hope that doesn't put anyone off, but it might lead to a better learning experience. Let's crack on with it. Now then, onto the guide. Now this is going to be a lot shorter than my other videos, I'm pretty sure, because I'm going to be going over it in detail still, but I'm going to condense the information and not babble on as much. Part of that's because it's not live commentary and part of that's because there's a lot of information to go over. This will be a breakdown of every mechanic and how to deal with those mechanics. And then we're going to go through the invocations, what they do, and then at the end we're going to go through a bunch of tips and tricks. Now, when you first enter the boss room here using the teleport crystal, you don't actually start the fight. You have to begin the fight by speaking to Osmonton, the ghost in front of the obelisk. If you observe the room, there's an obelisk in the middle. There's a warden at the left and the right side from the camera angle that I'm facing now. And there's this little fork on each side of the obelisk. The fork on each side on the floor is important. This is how the statues charge faster. Little red orbs will come from each side and charge the statues up. Now, when a statue is fully charged, they will do a special attack. If the player does not stand on one side of the statue, both statues will charge at the same time, causing the specials from the statues to be done at the same time. To stop this, you simply stand on the fork. You'll take some damage, the statue will still charge, but the other one will charge faster. And this is how you stagger their specials. Before we go into this any further, let's actually go over the specials for this phase. Now, this phase is very simple. All you have to do is kill the obelisk. As I said, the Wardens at the side will charge up. Now, both Wardens have the same abilities, Charged Shot and Disco Party. They'll always start with Disco Party and then Charged Shot and then cycle it like that. The Warden on the left will do Disco Party's vertical and horizontal to the obelisk and the Warden on the right will do Disco Party's diagonal to the obelisk. Now, what is Disco Party? Disco Party is a special attack where small pyramids will spread throughout the area. Each of these pyramids are 3x3, three three, and if the player does not stagger the statues, both of them will come at the same time and cover the entire floor, meaning you'll more than likely die. I do believe there are four safe spots which are right at the corner of the room. It's not ideal because then you can't really hit the obelisk. By staggering them, you can make them look like this. As seen in the clip, only one disco party happens at once, meaning there's always a 3x3 three three square of safe area around you. So just make sure you're studying that. After both Wardens have used Disco Party, they use Charge Shot. Now, the Warden on the left will fire a big ball that if you're in a team, you'll have to DD on. That just means you all have to stand on the same spot, much like a Sota Seg ball at Theatre of Blood. The Warden on the right will fire small balls, and for this, you need to split up. If you are stood together, you'll all take the damage for each. So be very careful. Left Warden, big ball, stack. Right Warden, small balls, split. Simple as that. In solos, however, it's a little bit more of a problem because you're forced to tank the damage. There are no mechanics that we know of yet, highly doubt there are any, that can block this damage, so you will take a lot. In a normal mode run, this is probably between 55 to 60 damage for tanking both, so make sure that you eat up. And that is all there is to the obelisk phase. You attack the obelisk, and until it dies, the Wardens will cycle. Now, if you don't tank any Wardens, obviously you'll probably die, but if you somehow get through the phase, it will pick a random Warden for your final fight. The Warden choice does matter. 
On P2, it's basically identical, apart from the fact that you start with magic on one and range with the other. However, on P3, the warden that you tank decides what your final boss is going to be like. If you tank the warden on the left, you'll get Zabak and Barba. If you tank the warden on the right, you will get Arka and Kefri. We'll go through what that means later on. Now, let's move on to P2. Now, when the obelisk dies, the warden that got charged the most, aka the one that you didn't block, will come to life. Doesn't matter which one you power up, the only thing it affects is the final fight. Remember the bosses that we went over earlier. However, the only other difference in the fights is that if you spawn the west one, you have to range it first, and if you spawn the right one, you mage it first. Simple as that. It is worth noting that every time you down the warden, it will swap its prayers. So again, on the left one, you start with range, when you down it, you'll have to mage it, and then when you down it again, you'll have to range it. They just cycle between having to range or mage it every time it goes down. Now, let's go through the special attacks in phase two. There's two things to watch out for. The Wardens have their own attacks and the Obelisk in the middle is still your enemy. What I mean by that is it also fires its own attacks out. So, first we'll go through the Wardens. Now, the Wardens are pretty good because it's another skill based fight on P2. What I mean by that is it's kind of like Zabak. The damage isn't calculated on your character until you are hit. So, it's reactionary praying again. They've got a magic attack that looks like this, a range attack that looks like this, and these, as long as you are praying when they hit you, it will negate most of the damage. They do, however, have two special attacks in this phase. First, imprisonment. The Warden fires a dark coloured projectile at your position when it fires it. It doesn't really do much. If you get hit by it, you'll turn into stone, much like the Basilisk Knights. However, you can still swap your prayers in this state. So the worst thing in this scenario is the Warden walks up to you to melee you, so make sure you put Protect from melee on and react to its range and magic attacks. The floor might get you because, again, I'm going to go through them soon, but the Obelisk has some floor attacks. But other than that, it's pretty easy. However, to dodge it, you simply just walk a tile away from it. As long as you're not on the exact tile it fires at, you won't get hit. Now comes a fun one. The last special the Wardens have is called Divine Projectile. Now, at first, when I dealt with this, I weren't really sure what to do because I just saw a load of different coloured objects. However, there is a pattern to it. This attack is kind of like Ulm. So, at Ulm, in Chambers, whenever it uses a certain attack, it will disable your prayers and then fire a coloured orb at you. You have to pray and put your prayer on before it hits you to negate the damage. This is basically the same. The Warden will disable your prayers and it will fire either a scimitar, an arrow or a spell at you. The arrow looks like an arrow, the scimitar looks like a scimitar, and the spell looks like an orb. Depending on which one's launched, you have to use protect from melee, range, or magic respectively. That means for a scimitar you pray melee, for an arrow you pray range, and for a spell you pray magic. If you pray correctly, you'll mitigate most of the damage. If you don't pray, you will get hit for a lot. It's worth noting, as you can see in this image that I've put on the screen, the chat box also gets a message, stating, The Warden launches an arcane spell, fires an arcane arrow or throws an arcane scimitar. So if you're not confident in the projectiles themselves, when your prayer gets turned off, look at the chat box. They're colour coordinated, purple is magic, green is range, and red is melee. And that's all of the Warden's attacks for P2. But now we've got to go over the Obelisk. As I said, when you're fighting the Warden, the Obelisk will also attack you. Now in the base fight, these don't affect your prayers, but if you have the Penetration Invocation on, Every single obelisk attack if you get hit will turn your prayer off, bear that in mind. We'll go through that in the invocation section later. The obelisk's attacks are converging beam, where it'll shoot out two beams at the north and south or west and east, and an X or arrow-like pattern will form on the floor. Now, this will slowly move forwards towards the middle of the room, and you have to avoid it. There's two ways. One is to stand on a similar tile to what I am now and then just run to the side because the first one disappears. And the second is just to run straight through the beam. As long as you've got your path incorrect, you will not be damaged. Second, windmill beam. This is probably the most recognizable because four giant areas on the floor get covered in red circles. Now, there are some really easy and interesting ways to dodge these, but I'll go over that in the tips and tricks section later. But basically, it's floor damage in an AoE area and it'll move anti-clockwise. If you stood on top of the red circles, you will take damage. If you're not stood on them, you won't. Simple as that. And finally, the lightning skull attack. 
This can get confusing because the obelisk will launch red skulls onto the floor. The problem is it's the exact same sprite as the warden's magic attack so you might get a little bit confused at first. The best way to recognise it is there'll be a shadow on the floor first but when these skulls hit the floor they'll discharge into a 7x7 area of lightning. And this is a square area so it covers quite a lot of space and it can throw multiple at once so be very careful. And that is everything you need to know about the P2 mechanics. Now let's go through the fight loop. As I said, when you down a warden, it will fall to the floor and then the next time it comes up, you'll use the opposite attack. However, there's a phase while it's on the floor. When you first kill a warden, a core will spawn. This core takes maximum damage every hit from melee attacks. So do not use range or magic on it as you won't always max hit. When you hit the core, five times the damage dealt will be dealt to the warden. Now, as you max with melee every hit, this means if you hit a 45, the boss is going to take 225 damage. If you hit a 50, it's going to take 250 damage. So, melee is the way to go. As I said, do not use anything else on this. To defeat P2, what you need to do is attack this core and kill the Warden. However, it only has a set time. Jagex made some changes to this recently, where the core now functions in an interesting way. On the first down, you have about 20 ticks, meaning you can get 6 hits of a 4 tick weapon in. The best thing to do here is to instantly attack the core the ticket comes out, attack it 5 times, then swing a big hitting weapon into it for the final hit. For example, a god sword that's slow but hits a lot. From Jagex's Warden in the recent changes blog, it seems to be that whenever the Warden goes down and the core spawns, you get more ticks to hit the core. However, from my experimenting, that is not the case, it's actually based on health thresholds. Now, I don't know the specifics, but if you down the Warden and attack the core 6 times by punching it and only doing a little bit of damage, the next down is also only 20 ticks, and then when you get it a little bit lower, it goes to 24 ticks and then 28, so it's health based. From testing, it seems that if you get the first down to about half health, then the next down you'll get 40 ticks, which is double. So you can go from 6 hits to 10 or 11. Bear that in mind when you're fighting the Warden. If it's about a quarter of its health gone, you'll get about 8 hits in. If 3 quarters are gone, you'll get about 12. So, it's a lot better than it used to be for consistent downs. After the allotted time for the down, the Warden will stand back up, and that's when it will swap to the opposite prayer, and you will have to use the opposite style. So again, if you down the left Warden, you have to range it, attack the core until it either dies or the Warden gets back up, and if the Warden gets back up, you'll then have to swap to Mage Gear and repeat the process. And that's the entirety of P2. So now we're on to Phase 3. Now believe it or not, Phase 3 is a lot more simple than Phase 2. Phase 2 had a lot going on. So let's dive right into the mechanics. As you can see on my screen, I have a tile marked in the middle. It's important to have some indication of the middle because of what we're going to go through now. Now the entire essence of this fight until the enraged phase is the ground attacks. This boss cannot hit you, it doesn't throw things at you, it doesn't do magic, range or melee damage so there's no need to pray a protection prayer. All it does is it slams the floor. As you can see in the clip that's playing, you have to stand at the right, then the left, then the middle. And this will avoid all of its attacks. Now if it was just that simple, obviously it wouldn't be the final boss of a raid. So, at 80%, 60%, 40% and 20% or around there, it'll go through another phase. The Warden will protect from magic range and melee, so you can't hit it at all, and it'll spawn four Skull Siphons on the floor. These look like the Warden's magic attack. Now this is important. All of these Skulls need to be killed quickly. It's got a time limit on it. In the base fight, it's quite lenient, you're fine, but with some invocations on, you've not got much time at all. You can miss maybe two or three ticks tops. If you hit them all, it damages the boss. If you miss any, you get damaged heavily. It's also worth noting that these Skull Siphons cannot be hit with magic or range and can only be hit with melee. However, all melee weapons become essentially one tick, they do not reset their attack timer. So you can even whack god swords into these at one tick apart, it's really fun. In a solo, the pattern for these skulls is the exact same every time. At 80% it's 4 in a diamond, at 60% it's 5 in a W, at 40% it's 6 in two lines of 3, and at 20% it's just like the one with 5, but there's 7 instead. Now I'm going to show you the optimal pattern for each. It's as follows. For 4. For 5. For 6.
and for seven. Now again, in solos these will never change, however, in teams there will. The more members you've got, the more Skull Siphons will spawn. However, they'll stick to a similar pattern. So the first one that's in a diamond shape will try to stick in diamonds. The second one with two lines of three will have more rows, etc, etc. Once each Skull phase has been completed, then it'll be back to the boss fight of dodging the floor. It's worth noting that if you've not got the Insanity Invocation on, it will always start back attacking the left, so you start every phase after skulls standing at the right hand side of the middle tiles. And then left, and then middle, then right, left, middle, and repeat. When the second skull phase begins, it'll spawn its first guardian shadow. These are remnants of previous bosses in the raid. Again, as we went through earlier, if you tank the left warden, you will get Zabak and Barbar, and if you tank the right minion, you will get Arka and Kefri. Now the first one of these will be Arka or Zibak, depending on the Warden, and that spawns after the second Skull Phase. The other one, Kefri or Barbar, will spawn on the third Skull Phase, and they'll be around for the rest of the fight. Now let's quickly go through all of the boss's shadows. First, Arka. Arka will always attack starting with range, and it'll do three ranged attacks. Then it'll do an animation to swap stance, and then use three magic attacks. This cycle continues for the entirety of the fight. It's worth noting, however, that to avoid this damage or mitigate it, you must be praying as the projectile comes out. So for this, you need to react in advance. You've got to pray before it fires the projectile. It's worth noting, Arka's shadow, much like the boss fight, can hit you through prayer. It'll just mitigate most of the damage, so bear that in mind. However, it's a lot easier to pray against when there's a lot more going on. Kefri, who spawns alongside Arka, will fire the fireballs from the Kefri boss fight at your location. Now again, much like the boss fight, these are really easy to dodge and you've got a lot of time, but as there's a lot of things going on on the floor in the last phase of this fight, it can get pretty hectic. There's a very, very important thing to note with Kefri, however. If you have the invocation on, Aerial Assault, the fireball from Kefri will be 3x3 three three on the final phase as well and deal more damage. So be very careful with that. If you have that invocation on, I'd recommend you go the Zabak and Barbar route. On the topic of Zabak and Barbar, let's talk about those next. So, Zabak is the counterpart to Arka in this fight, it spawns on the left hand side. Now, Zabak, much like the fight with it, will use ranged and magic attacks. The ranged ones are the big black pyramids, and the magic ones are the red spheres. Now, the thing about Zabak on this phase, much like the fight, is that if you pray correctly, you will mitigate all of the damage. So Arka can hit through prayer, but Zabak's Phantom cannot. They'll be fully blocked as long as you're praying correctly. Also, these are reactionary prayer switches, not preemptive ones. So like Arka, you have to pray before the projectile comes out. With Zabak, you pray before the projectile hits you. So as long as you're running around and you put your prayer on, the ticket hits you, or any time before that, you will not be damaged. Bear that in mind. Barber hasn't really got much going for it, it's the counterpart to Kefri in this fight, and all it does is fires boulders at your spot. Kefri uses magic damage, if you're praying magic and Kefri's fireball hits you, it will do less damage on the final phase, and Barbar, if you're praying ranged, it'll do less damage. Barber's doesn't get increased with invocations, Kefri's gets the 3x3 with aerial assault, Barbar gets no buffs, so this fight is generally a little bit easier, because you can block all of Zabak's damage. It's just harder to prayer switch, because obviously you're reacting and it can swap range magic range magic, rather than knowing that three range three magic are coming and swapping like that and keeping track of it. Now after Kefrit or Barbara has spawned after the third skull phase, it's got one more skull phase at 20% health. And then, it's the exact same fight until around 5%. At 5% it'll enrage and there's no need to dodge the floor attack anymore because it will not do it so you do not need to go right, left, middle or anything like that. What happens instead is the tiles will start peeling away from the back of the room. Now bear in mind it cannot peel every tile away, you will at least have one row to play with but this phase is a DPS check, meaning if you don't do it in time you'll basically get to a point where it's almost impossible to avoid all the damage. There are methods if you're incredibly talented, however it's very very difficult so it's not something that most people would be able to do. While the tiles are peeling back, you still have to deal with the shadows, the bosses, and a floor attack which is lightning. 
This is shadows on the floor that after a certain amount of time will deal damage on that tile. So you've got to make sure that when you're attacking you are not stood on a tile with lightning on. As you can see, I'm going to constantly move around as I hit. In the tips and tricks section we'll have a couple of ways to deal with this. And honestly, that is the entire fight. For the last phase, all you do is dodge the floor and then deal with the skulls. And then dodge the floor, deal with the skulls. And then a shadow spawns, you pray against that properly while dealing with the boss fight normally again. And the second shadow spawns. And then that is basically the entire fight until the enrage and then you've just got to kill the boss. Again, it's not as easy as it sounds, but that is genuinely all there is to it. So, let's go over a few of the Warden's Invocations now, because everything we've just gone through is the base fight. Now, on to the Invocations. It's worth noting, the Path Relics actually do nothing on this last fight, because there's no path associated with it. It's just simply the final boss. Now, on that note, there's more invocations for the Wardens than there is for any other boss. There are six in total. However, most of them are pretty self-explanatory and won't require a video explanation to go along with them. Let's go through those now. First, Ancient Haste. This will cause the Wardens to charge at a faster rate in the first phase of the fight. All this means is when you tank a side and the statues are charging, what happens is they just charge faster. So the specials come out quicker. That means you're probably going to end up getting the 3rd and 4th special, which are the balls that you have to DD and split on. So in solos, you're probably going to take some guaranteed damage if you put this invocation on. Next is Acceleration. Now again, this one's really self-explanatory. The Wardens will attack quicker and the Obelisk will charge at a faster rate in the second phase of the fight. All that means is during the second phase, when you're killing it, the Wardens will attack faster. I believe it's only a tick, but it does mean that you are going to have to react quicker. And the obelisk in the middle will use its attacks, the windmill, the X that comes across, and the lightning skulls more often, so bear that in mind. The third invocation, aptly named Penetration, makes the Warden's obelisk on P2 have stronger attacks. Now, as well as having stronger attacks, they get an additional effect. I stated it earlier in the video, but it means that getting hit by any of its three specials will disable your prayer, so be very careful. This is especially scary if you get trapped in the stone from the Warden, and then the red floor comes underneath you, turns your prayer off, and then you take a lot of damage, so be very careful with this one. Now we get into the fun three. These three come as a bundle. What I mean by that is you can't put Insanity on without Overclocked 2, and you can't put Overclocked 2 on without Overclocked 1. So what exactly do they do? All of these affect the final phase of the fight. They do not affect P1 or P2, these are all P3. And they're very simple. So the Warden's attack in the final phase of the fight is the Ground Slam. So this makes the ground attack one tick faster, which isn't that bad to deal with. But then you go to Overclock 2, which again, does the exact same thing. It just makes the Slam attack one tick faster. That is all both these do. But suddenly it's two ticks faster, and now it's a four tick Slam. So if you've got a four tick weapon, you can do one hit on each side just, but you have to be tick perfect. And then the final invocation, the one that's going to need some video footage, Insanity. Now, this one <laughs> is aptly named Insanity. The Wardens will become unstoppable, not for the faint of heart. Now, this doesn't really go into what it does. First, much like Overclocked and Overclocked 2, Insanity increases the slam attack by an additional one tick. What does this mean? Well, it becomes a three tick slam attack. And that means if you've got a four tick weapon, you can't do one hit on every side anymore. You're going to have to delay some. So let's take a little look at how this looks in game. As you can see here, there's a three tick ground slam. I can't attack on every single side with a buffer. As you can see, I've got to run between them and stagger my attacks in some places to not take damage. And it can get pretty difficult. Now I'm gonna show you what happens with the skull phase. Here is the six skull phase and I only missed a few ticks. I did misclick here, but as you can see, I was miles off from hitting the last skull and watch the damage that gets taken. It's deadly. Now let's take a look at what happens after a skull phase. As you can see here, I wasn't ready for this. This is my first insanity attempt ever. I just thought I'd record it for fun. This was a, a quite a while ago, to be honest. But if you take a look, out of habit, I stand on the right hand side. But because it saves where it's at for each phase, after the skulls, it actually starts at a different place, meaning that I take damage and completely lose where I am. So it's very scary. And while all this is going on, let's take a look at the final enrage phase. I've not sped this up at all, 
But as you can see, the tiles are peeling away very fast and the lightning on the floor is a lot quicker and spawns a lot faster. So, insanity is insane. Now that all the invocations have been gone over, let's take a look at some tips and tricks. Probably the part that all of you have been looking forward to. Now we'll go through each phase one at a time. On P1, there's not really much advice. We've already gone over that the corners and the side of the room are technically safe spots for the disco lights, just in case you screw up for any reason. Other than that, there's not really much to go over, apart from kill it as fast as possible. If you want to use a BGS or Dragon War Armor spec here to achieve that on higher invocations, feel free to do so. Now, for P2, we have quite a few tips and tricks. First of all, due to how runescape pathing works, all of the obelisk specials can actually be ran into. What I mean by this is that you can run over all three of the attacks. You can run through the lightning skulls and not take damage. You can run through the red X and not take damage. And you can run over the floor tiles that are red and not take damage. For that one, you've got to make sure to try and use a thinner area though. Next, there is actually kind of a corner safe spot for the right warden. It doesn't work for the left because it still comes with melee as you, but the one at the right doesn't. So if you stand in the corner that I'm stood in here, all the warden does is it'll fire its normal attacks. However, you don't have to worry about much. If it uses the attack that turns you to stone, just walk a tile to the left and then back. If it uses the red X attack, the corner's actually a safe spot, believe it or not. So standing in this corner actually just nullifies that attack completely. You've still got to watch out for the lightning skulls and the red floor, but for the red floor, you can just move three tiles away, then move back to the corner. Now, this isn't too useful, but if someone's just learning the boss fight and doesn't want to do all the running around or you're low on energy, this can be a very useful tip. Another small piece of advice is for the windmill attack, the one where it spawns four lots of red floor. If you stand on this tile at the obelisk and then run to this tile, you can avoid the entire damage and it's nice and easy. It's just an easy way to do it if you're not confident in your pathing abilities. Now the final tip for phase two is how to actually get a two down on expert mode. Now some people have been asking for this and this will help people in lowering vacations too. But my friend reality has sent me a clip here because I have not got a two down yet. But as you can see on phase one, it has five DDS specs into the biggest smack you can do. He uses a D war hammer. And then on the second down, he gets 10 attacks. So he does the rest of the DDS and then claws it to death. Now he is in max gear. However, if you lower the invocation, so if you do 150 to 250, or if you're in bandos even, you can probably still get the two down because he still had an entire attack left and over hit on the ninth attack. So bear that in mind, if you want to try a two down, try this method. And now onto the final phase. For the final phase, there's three things I'd like to go over. First, a common question that I keep getting asked in the comments is how do you avoid a lot of the lightning damage on the last phase? Because a lot of people struggle with it. I myself did it first, as you've seen in the old footage that I show in these videos. But there's a pretty simple and effective way to deal with it. If you take your weapon's attack speed and minus it by one, as long as you move that many tiles before you attack, you'll be able to avoid almost all of the damage as long as you understand how pathing works and understanding that you can move two tiles away or in an L and you won't actually physically run over the first tile, meaning if there's lightning there, you will avoid it. For example, with a blowpipe, it's a two tick weapon. Minus one, you want to move one tile, hit boss, one tile, hit boss. Just make sure the one tile that you move to does not have any shadow on it and you'll be able to attack and move off in time, even if lightning spawns there. Now, another example is with a buffer. A buffer on rapid is a four tick weapon. So minus one is three. So if you move three tiles and make sure that the third tile has no lightning on it and no shadow, then you hit the boss and then do it again and hit the boss and repeat. This way you'll be able to avoid almost all of the damage if you are focused. Another thing you can do if you're very skilled, again, courtesy of reality for this clip, is if you fail the skull mechanic on insanity or even normal boss, you get a lot of time on it, but it is still possible to fail. The Warden doesn't do a guaranteed hit like firing a projectile at you. The damage that you take is actually caused by a floor attack that covers the entire floor. However, if you have perfect timing, you can actually run over the floor and dodge this entirely. Now, timing this perfect is going to be very difficult, but if you have messed up, click towards the middle of the room and hopefully you can dodge it. It's probably a 50-50 chance. 
depending on the tick that you click on, whether it's odd or even. However, it is still possible and your fight might not come to an end. On the same vein of dodging the floor, you can actually Wooks walk P3. What I mean by this, you can put a blowpipe on or another weapon where you're moving every tick. And during the slam attack on the floor, if you Wooks walk like you would at Vorkath, then you can avoid all the damage as long as you are on the correct tick. Now to get on the correct tick, you need to click the boss to attack the tick that it uses a slam attack in a direction. And then start your Wooks walk from there. And you'll be able to dodge all of the damage. Now that's it for the tips and tricks in this video. I hope you enjoyed that. And I hope you enjoyed the Warden's Guide as a whole. This ended up being a lot longer and a lot more effort than I thought it would. And I know that I've been rambling on a lot, but every single piece of speech that I've been doing in this video, I believe has a purpose. If you skipped through to any of the parts, I hope you enjoyed that. And hopefully the timestamps in the description enabled you to do so. Good luck on purple drops. Love you and leave you. And I'll see you next time. Bye.